with this. And um, I would like just to say a few words about energy access as more participants are arriving. In 2019, 771 million people around the world lack access uh, to electricity. And on top of that, 2.6 billion people need improved access to clean and safe cooking fuels and technologies. And on top, uh, we have um, socioeconomic impacts of energy poverty. And uh, of course, as the COVID-19 pandemic also showed to us, lack of uh, access to energy hampers uh, mainly the most weak parts of the population. So accounting for the distributional impacts of climate change mitigation policies and how these impacts are compatible with sustainable goals one, uh, seven and 13 uh, is very important. And um, today I'm going to share my screen. Today we have um, make it big. Today we have th with us um, three experts to share insights on uh, methodologies and data about integrating energy poverty and energy access into energy systems modeling. We have Dr. Sonali Pachauri, who is a, a leader in the research group of the transformative institutional and social solutions. Uh, in the Energy, Climate and Environment Program at the International Institute for Applied System Analysis at IASA in Austria. She is a lead author for the IPCC Working Group 3, Assessment Report 6, serves on the Science Advisory ban Panel of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and on the Advisory Group of the International Network on Gender and Energy. Her research explores policy pathways for achieving universal access to basic services and technologies and assesses the wider impacts of the sustainable development. And today, uh, Sonali will present recent highlights from research analyzing future scenarios of access to modern energy services globally and the potential implications of the pandemic and climate change mitigation for achieving the universal energy access goal. Our second speaker, is Gianluca Tonolo. Gianluca is an electrical engineer that spends his career working on energy and climate data, indicators, and analysis. He also has experience in low carbon strategy development as he spent three years as a consultant in the private sector. He is now in charge of the International Energy Agency modeling team on access to modern energy. And uh, Today, he will present us how the IA is tracking access to energy and how IA built um, the forward-looking scenarios that we have uh, seen all of us in the World Energy Outlook series and other publications. And uh, last but not least, we, we have Antene Danaccio. Antene is a researcher in energy and development at PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Energy Agency. He is presenting about modeling productive uses of energy for micro enterprises and the impact on energy planning in the region. And uh, with that, I would like now to invite our first speaker, uh, Sonali Patsauri, to talk uh, about um, the first topic of our meeting. We will run the session like this that uh, every question that you have, uh, you will put it on the chat. And uh, then I will collect all of them towards the end of our uh, meeting. So first we are going to have our presentations and then we are going to have a discussion session with one exception, with uh, the exception of, of the presentation of Gianluca uh, because Gianluca has another obligation. So after Gianluca's presentation, I will be able to take um, three um, maximum four uh, urgent uh, questions di to directed to Gianluca. Um, due to technicalities, I will uh, share now again my screen for uh, the slides from Sonali, and I will be uh, the mouse <laughs> for her. So one moment, please. Okay, Sonali. Please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Evangelos, and thank you also for organizing this webinar and inviting me to speak today um, on this topic that's uh, dear to my heart and also a very important part of the research that we do at YASA in our group. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is sort of results from some recent modeling uh, exercises that we have undertaken to really look at scenarios of access to modern energy services, how compatible this is with climate mitigation goals, and uh, of course, um, some uh, also recent results of um, the impacts of the pandemic on uh, clean cooking access. Next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, we all have this background that we know very well already, and I'm just kind of giving this as a little bit of a uh, um, uh, starter to the talk. We know energy is an engine of modern world. We know that the distribution of energy is very unequal around the globe. Uh, many are without access to even basic electricity and clean cooking services, whereas uh, many others use much more. And uh, we know that there are important externalities associated with energy, uh, social and environmental. Um, and also that in the past, energy transitions have occurred at a very low, slow pace, whereas what we are requiring now of the energy system to meet climate mitigation goals is kind of an unprecedented transformation. Uh, in addition, we know that uh, investments required for the energy sector are large and they are long lived. So of course, there is the issue of stranded assets as well. Next slide, please. Um, so this is kind of just a little again background. We know uh, this is the global map of uh, energy use per person. Um, regions where energy use per person on average is very high. Uh, this is national averages, uh, other regions where it's extremely low. Uh, so again, reflecting uh, regions of affluence and poverty and low development and high development as we have uh, known already. So uh, next slide, please. Um, when we're talking about energy access, of course, the first question is what do we mean by modern energy access? How do we define it? How do we measure it? Um, and next slide, please. Uh, when we look at the SDG seven goals, we know there are three goals, um, access, universal access, increasing the share of renewable energy and doubling the rate of energy efficiency. And now if you look even just at uh, 7.1, which is universal access, uh, there are varying reports of how many people are without access to universal modern energy services. So official indicators suggest 2.6 billion without clean cooking access. Whereas we know that actually it's more close to something like 4 billion or more that are still reporting some use of solid fuels, uh, though their primary reliance may be on clean cooking. Uh, similarly, we know officially the indicator says there are 759 million without electricity access. Whereas actually, if you consider people with access to reliable electricity, this is a much higher number, again, close to 3.5 billion. Next slide, please. So uh, of course, there is a shift now to measuring access beyond binary indicators, which are the SDG indicators, such as those initiatives by the World Bank uh, with the multi-tier framework, where they're distinguishing different dimensions of access, so not just um, whether people are connected or not, but also aspects of reliability, affordability, quality, and so on. And then distinguishing not just those who have access from those who don't, but different tiers of access. Uh, of course, this is a big step change in how measurement of access is done and uh, is, is really a big step forward, in fact. Um, next slide, please. But of course, there are issues also with the MTF. And uh, we have done some research to kind of review measures of poverty, energy poverty measurement. And uh, we have also tried to assess how one can improve on the MTF and other measures that are out there. So, I mean, currently there's an inadequate um, focus on demand and access to services, much more on supply. 
and also consumption and capacity is often kind of taken as a proxy for services. So there can be some undermining of the efficiency goals. Uh, dimensions like affordability are poorly captured. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are other issues of acceptability and uh, contextual differences that also matter. Next slide, please. Uh, we have come up with our own alternative framework, which builds on the multi-tier framework. Um, and uh, we have recently published research on the application of this alternative framework to 10 countries that are shown here in the graphs. Uh, I won't go into the details, but basically uh, the measures of access in this case combine aspects of reliability and affordability and service access. Uh, so both for electricity and for clean cooking. And uh, basically what we see from our analysis is that in fact, many, many more are without access if we consider all these different dimensions than what is captured by the official binary indicators. So uh, in fact, those that are served uh, by you know, just con counting connections are many more than those that have actually reliable, affordable access to these services. Next slide, please. So in, in other recent work that we've done, we've carried out uh, research to look at access to energy services in the home. And uh, this is a recent article that was published in Nature Energy. Uh, and I will present just some main highlights of this research. So next slide, please. Uh, what we have tried to do in this work is basically understand drivers for preferences for energy services and demand, and uh, basically use that to inform analysis of how future shifts in socioeconomic and demographics uh, and how uh, that drives electricity access and makes it more affordable and how that influences energy demand uh, over time. And so basically it's using a very granular bottom-up residential appliance and energy demand model uh, using micro data from national household surveys. So we don't have surveys for every country in the world, of course, but we take surveys from key countries in uh, message, uh, which is our uh, energy systems model, the message regions, and then try to represent uh, populations from th using those national data for the global, uh, the entire globe. Uh, here we see the results of this analysis. And uh, one of the key um, results of this is that despite significant income growth and urbanization, we see that even under sort of optimistic futures, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways one, for instance, SSP one in this graph, as we see, there will be huge inequalities in the amount of energy used uh, across regions and across populations. So in much of um, the global South, we will have about two thirds of the population still using less than five gigajoule per capita. Whereas much of the global north will use more than 50, 10 times that amount, so over 50 gigajoule per capita. Uh, and that under stringent climate mitigation scenarios, uh, there is some effect, but not much of much effect on, on uh, energy poverty, in, so that there is a slight increase in the share of population using less uh, energy per capita. Next slide, please. Uh, we have also looked at what this means in terms of access to services, specific services. So we look at service access for thermal comfort, for food preparation and conservation, for entertainment and cleaning. And uh, again, what we see are there are vast inequities and these persist over time, even in optimistic baseline scenarios. Uh, but like for instance, we see less unequal access for entertainment services as compared to thermal comfort and food preparation and conservation. Next slide, please. And then of course, this is also based very much on looking at the diffusion of appliances, individual appliances that 
provide these services in individual homes. And again, we see huge inequities. So this is just um, looking at air conditioner ownership for as an example in South Asia. And you can see that in urban and rural areas, it differs widely. And under different socioeconomic futures, it also differs widely. Next slide, please. Uh, in another piece of work, we've looked at clean cooking access, uh, and this are scenarios under the a post-pandemic future, also looking at climate mitigation futures. Next slide. Uh, and uh, our key uh, objective in this was to look at drivers of preferences for cooking stoves and cooking fuels, but accounting for multiple fuel use, because often uh, we only look at primary stoves and that under estimates the extent of people dependent on solid fuels. Um, next slide, please. So our key takeaway from this research shows that actually a protracted recession uh, after the pandemic could leave an additional close to 500 million people unable to afford clean cooking services in 2030, relative to a reference scenario uh, with sort of moderate economic growth and income distribution like under SSP2. Uh, and um, also ambitious climate mitigation can result in people not being able to afford clean cooking, particularly in certain parts of the world. So, uh, you know, basically our findings underline the need for immediate acceleration and efforts of making clean cooking accessible and affordable for all, because this is uh, where uh, the globe is actually moving very slowly and far behind what we want to achieve by 2030. Next slide. Um, what we also see is that, of course, income poverty and cooking poverty are highly correlated, but this differs quite a bit by region. So in regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, we see that income poverty and cooking poverty are very highly correlated. Um, but in other regions, because of policies largely, uh, we see that there are fewer people who are cooking poor as, I mean, poor income poor as compared to cooking poor. So um, uh, this is again an important takeaway from this. Next slide, please. Um, the final example of research I want to highlight is uh, research that has looked at uh, trying to define how much the energy requirements for providing decent life for all is. And this is research that was done by colleagues of mine uh, in the program, um, published in environmental research letters last year. So next slide. Uh, there has been, of course, a long history of um, studies that have tried to estimate energy needed for decent living, starting way back from uh, the efforts of Goldenberg and all in 1985, where they estimated one kilowatt per capita for basic needs and more. But then also other research that has taken kind of more of a macro approach to estimating how energy use correlates with uh, human development index and so on and so forth. Next slide. In our work, we uh, take much more of a bottom-up approach. And the starting point was to define a standard universal set of living standards that are important for living a decent life, and then estimate globally the gaps for um, meeting these decent life standards. Um, and then we've defined different normative scenarios for achieving decent living standards for all by 2040 and compared these to other mitigation and baseline scenarios. Next slide, please. So the basket of uh, decent living standards are basically both including direct energy needs in the home, but then also indirect infrastructure and energy needs for providing basic services like uh, healthcare, education, mobility, um, nutrition, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. And this is basically um, the set of basic needs that we consider important to the basket of decent living and also the material satisfiers that are important to meeting a special, you know, a set threshold of basic needs. Of course, this is not everything that is considered important for well-being. There are many other things, but these are the key things that have important energy and material 
repercussions, and that's why uh, we define them in this way. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a global map of uh, the gaps in DC living services for all. So we see, of course, there are certain parts of the world where the gaps are larger than in other parts of the world. And in general, of course, in the global south, there are many more gaps than in the global north, uh, as we would expect. So this is a much broader um, um, understanding of energy access, which is going way beyond what is in the SDG 7, uh, but still uh, is considered uh, important aspects of uh, uh, energy needs that allow for a good life. Uh, next slide, please. So our final results on the analysis of the energy requirements, uh, of course, these needs are the same everywhere, but the energy requirements to meet these needs differ regionally, because obviously, uh, cooling requirements are different, energy intensities are different in different parts of the world. But we find that these vary between 9 to 36 gigajoule per capita per year. And of course, there are some parts of the world, as you see in this graph here, where uh, current averages exceed these uh, DLE thresholds, whereas in other parts of the world, we are far away from uh, having an average that meets these DLE thresholds. Next slide, please. Um, again, another important takeaway from um, our result is that even under um, very stringent mitigation scenarios, so for example, well below two degrees or one and a half degree compatible mitigation scenarios, the average final energy needs that are compatible with these, I mean, the estimated total final energy uh, that is compatible with this goal is way above what we estimate as needed for reaching decent living for all by 2040. So in other words, there's more than enough energy globally to meet decent living for all by 2040. But of course, in certain parts of the world, there will be much uh, need for increasing energy and there may be a uh, need for redistribution from uh, certain parts of the population to the other. But these of course are political. Uh, questions. So my last slide, uh, um, the main takeaways from our work is that basically trickle down economics does not work, that we need explicit policies and efforts to ensure that universal access to basic energy services and decent living standards are achieved for everyone. Uh, and that despite significant growth in energy demand in regions of the global south, we will see inequalities persist. Uh, and access for all is not likely without policy. Um, also, globally, we have enough energy to meet universal decent living standards, but we might require redistribution. And uh, climate mitigation and universal access goals are can be achieved simultaneously if the poor and vulnerable are shielded. So these are just some important key messages from the work, and I'm happy to discuss this further in the question answers later on. Thank you very much. Oh, um, well, for this useful and insightful insights on not only on energy, electricity or clean cooking access, but also on the need for uh, energy access, of access to decent living uh, standards and energy services. And I would like now to invite Gianluca to share his, um, his screen and uh, proceed with the presentation. Okay, good, everything is okay. Can you properly see the screen and hear me? Okay, Everything is much. perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Evangelos, for inviting uh, DIA uh, today uh, to speak about this important topic. And also, thank you very much, Shunali, already for the presentation. It was very interesting. I think I can skip some of, of the slides because you already covered uh, very well uh, some uh, important points uh, of access going beyond just uh, speaking about connections or uh, et cetera. Uh, so I'll try to be uh, quick, but uh, 
not too much <laughs> in the sense I'll try to uh, take more time for certain aspects of the presentations. And uh, it's very good actually that uh, Shonali went more into the theory and results since uh, I will try also to go more in details to how we technically do all the calculations and how we integrate in uh, our energy model uh, access to, to electricity and clean cooking. So we will see in this presentation, so a bit the, the introduction how we define access to modern energy very quickly, and then see some trends and projection results. And then we will look at uh, how we do the tracking and what are the barriers and problems that uh, we can uh, encounter while trying to track like uh, access to electricity and clean cooking, uh, as well as different methodologies that are used right now. And finally, I will try to show how in the World Energy Outlook model, uh, we uh, integrate access, uh, access to electricity and clean cooking. So I don't need to go through that, like what is access to modern energy is the SDG goal uh, 7.1. Uh, most in details that uh, speaks about ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Uh, the goal 7.1 specifically say that by 2030, we should achieve universal access. There is not a very technical definition of what access means. Uh, Shonali already explained that a connection is not always uh, meaning that uh, the person is receiving a, a good uh, service, uh, energy service to improve his life. So. This is not uh, something very defined and the different organization may take it uh, differently. I try to show a bit what, uh, uh, what we do at the IA, like for access to electricity, we try to include uh, for the moment uh, and for the analysis we do uh, residential access only also. So for the modeling work we do, we exclude productive uses that are touched by other parts of the model, namely agriculture or industry modeling. So here we touch only households modeling and uh, you know, a person can be connected by different kind of technologies, by the national main grid, by uh, decentralized or uh, disconnected from the grid solutions like mini grids and uh, standalone systems that can be, for example, as in this picture, uh, solar on systems. However, we don't consider as access uh, to electricity the smaller uh, standalone system that could be, for example, the Pico Solar or solar lanterns that besides providing uh, very good improvements in the welfare of people, like by providing, for example, lights and charging of phones, et cetera, uh, are not providing, as we can see, here, other uh, basic uh, and essential energy services that could be, for example, having a, a fan to cool a bit the house or having the information through a radio or a television. Uh, I think my connection was down for a moment. I guess you can hear me again now. Uh, so say that we consider access to electricity starting from the point where an essential bundle of appliances, namely normally we consider uh, some like four or five lighting bulbs, one fan, one television, and uh, some other small appliances to consider a now sold to be connected. However, you will see when we track historic access, this is not always the case is because many times from government, the IA receives information that is just based on a connection. We cannot have all this uh, disaggregating information of how, uh, or what appliances are used uh, beyond this uh, connection or this meter, et cetera. Uh, so I tried to define it, I hope it was uh, clear. We start from bigger standalone systems. And if someone of you knows, uh, is familiar with solar homes systems, we consider from 50 watts uh, above, or sometimes when efficient appliances are used that even some smaller system, especially for rural areas, we can consider as uh, people receiving us access from those. So from, uh, from uh, the clean cooking uh, point of view, you know, people can cook with uh, different fuels and everyone cooks. There is no people that are not cooking, probably very few <laughs> in the world. But the problem is here that many people are cooking with fuels that are polluting and harmful for, uh, uh, because of the gases that are released uh, while cooking. Those are mostly solid cooking fuels that include biomass and coal, but also kerosene is included in the polluting fuels that are not clean cooking. The IA defines clean cooking here as all the modern 
uh, energy sources that can be used for cooking, including fossil sources like LPG or natural gas. Uh, but that also includes the super efficient new improved cook, cooking stoves that can burn biomass. These are not like some of the stoves that are today in the market that even if they improve the efficiency of cooking are not still in line with uh, requirements uh, defined by the WHO. So in our modeling, the forward looking work we do, we consider that some people will gain access using improved cook stove so still use some charcoal, some biomass, especially in some specific areas. But for the historical work we do, we consider that all the stoves that burn biomass today are polluting stoves. Now we can see a bit of uh, trends and projection results. In the left side, we see the results of the WIO 2021 access to electricity. These are people that has no access, and this is defined at least for the historical part as uh, having a connection or not. And we try to include also of grid solution as defined as uh, far as possible. As we can see, we have uh, still a lot of people without access to electricity. And uh, besides a lot of progress that have been done in uh, some regions, especially in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa remains uh, with a very high share of its population is around today half the population actually in Sub-Saharan Africa that has no access at all, even if there's access without defining the quality. So if you even try to go more in depth and trying to define who has access level that is uh, reliable and uh, affordable and of quality, this number will be much higher as well. So we can see also our projection in the steps that is the blue line. We see what we think will happen if the policy stated till now will stay in places. So practically the situation will not change much. Many people will stay without access to electricity. And the green line is what needs to happen in the net zero emission scenario, the sustainable development scenario that uh, we developed in the IA that as, as one of the goals, besides climate goals, also achieving uh, the SDG 7 uh, goals. Similarly, it can be said from clean cooking, but as you see, we have much more people without uh, access to clean uh, cooking technologies. And uh, even in Asia, many countries are still uh, fighting with this problem, differently from electricity, where there has been very strong improvements. And also, the effort we have to do from now to 2030 to achieve the SDG 7 goal for clean cooking is much stronger than what we need for electricity. I think we just calculated that in sub-Saharan Africa and rural areas, the efforts done in the last five years need to increase by 100 times to achieve uh, access to clean cooking. So it's a, quite a very challenging uh, uh, effort. And this is why also we try to recommend building also synergies between clean cooking and electricity, but also other climate SDGs uh, to achieve this goal. When I say synergies between clean cooking and electricity, speak of course about electric cooking, but also there can be other uh, integrated programs that include the different, uh, 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 different uh, connections for electricity or clean cooking. If we see more in depth for uh, our projections, for the scenarios where we achieve full access uh, to electricity and clean cooking, you can see that we develop in our model uh, this by technology providing this access. So we, we can say that in our scenario, like this share of people is getting access with these specific technologies. As you can see, like for example, uh, in, um, in blue in the left side, grid technologies in Africa represent around 40% uh, of the people uh, gaining access uh, from now to 2030 in, uh, in these scenarios. And also a high share of that in the sustainable development scenario is coming from renewables. We also see that a very big chunk of the solution is uh, from off-grid uh, off solutions is there. Similar we do for clean cooking where, as you can see, LPG has a big share, but for rural areas where it's the biggest problem, still there are improved cook stuffs that uh, violet. Uh, area is still an important uh, part. I now go to the part about tracking, so historic data, and uh, trying to list here what are the tools or the sources to understand what is going on in general in energy, but with more details uh, on, uh, with a more focus on uh, access 
electricity. So important to know there are a lot of already existing administrative supply data. Some utilities know more than just how many people are connected. Unfortunately, for example, in Africa, many utilities have not a very good data uh, strategy or framework, so they don't really track very well uh, this connection. For example, some of them, if asked, they cannot tell you how many, how many kilowatt hours an household connection is, uh, uh, is consuming or not even able to say where this connection they have exactly are located. So they don't have this also geographical uh, uh, characteristic of the connection that can be very helpful for building access rates, especially when you want to convert it in people having access and not just dwellings or households. There are also rural electrification programs that have many informations available and the sales of products, especially in the off-grid sector, like you could find information from the sales of, for example, of solar systems or the, for example, the permits that have been uh, released for um, the construction of mini grids, for example. Then there are surveys that can be both business surveys or also surveys. Also surveys have a very high potential because you cannot directly ask a person if he has electricity and what kind of electricity he has. However, this has a very high cost, uh, but can be due every several years and use administrative data in between to cover for the gaps, for example. This is actually what we suggest normally to do in terms of energy data, even beyond uh, access. And you can do some estimation and modeling. Sometimes you can have uh, uh, smart meters that give you directly the data. This is especially true for mini grids. Mini grids now, because it's useful for them, for, uh, for billing their customers, they put in place uh, very extra smart meters so they know really well who is consuming, how much is consuming, et cetera, et cetera. So there is not a recommendation or a best source. Uh, we think that a combination of all those is, some, is uh, the solution to, very, to track any energy consumption and supply and production, including access to electricity and access uh, to clean cooking. We are now working actually on a, uh, on a project to develop a framework to track access to electricity in Africa. And we are working with some uh, experts and uh, also with uh, governments in Africa to try to understand their barriers and uh, best practices to track uh, access uh, to electricity. This will be released, I guess, uh, by the end of this year. What are common barriers? I'll go very quickly here. The difficulty is the differences in urban and rural areas, uh, especially, for example, on the household sites. Some countries just take a connection and then multiply this by the average household sites, while some connected houses have much more people inside than others. Sometimes uh, remote areas are uh, very difficult to track because they don't have a grid connection, they have no grid connection. So the data sometimes are not metered, especially if there is, they are coming from uh, standalone systems. And then there is also the difficulty of passing from the connections to an access uh, to electricity indicator access rates. If you want to go beyond as well to calculate the reliability quality, or for example, how the World Bank defined the tier uh, of uh, the access level, this becomes more and more difficult and more and more data are uh, required. But let's go now to the part where we try to explain what we do in the World Energy Outlook model in terms of access. In this slide, you can see a diagram that try to put together the World Energy Outlook model. From the right side, we have uh, the energy consumption, so the demand. And on the left, you can see the supply side. That is, of course, the energy that is produced uh, and supplied uh, to the final consumption. And in the middle, we have different uh, transformation and uh, consumption sites in between. We start at the IA doing a bottom-up approach, but we also calibrate with a supply approach. So we have a team that works on the supply side that looks at markets, uh, prices for different energy sources. And we have a team that work on end uses and demand that works on estimating how much energy is needed for each uh, subsector and by fuel. And then we put these things together and we calibrate and we do several runs and then we change things when needed uh, till we achieve a good uh, uh, scenario. What is 
access to uh, electricity, uh, access to electricity, including cooking into this uh, model. As you can see, sorry, here we have many animations, but as you can see, access to electricity, including cooking is part of the residential modeling. It's a model that we do a bit separately and where we try to estimate first country by country, how many people will gain access if policies stays as they are today, or how many people need to gain access to achieve SDG 7.1 by country. And then we feed all these into the residential model well, where we estimate what is the electricity demand, for example, that uh, is needed to cover for these people gaining access, and what are the different solutions that can provide uh, these, uh, these people gaining access with their uh, connection or their uh, fuel supply in case of clean cooking. So what is our approach for developing the scenarios is uh, developing a set of policies that describe uh, future uh, pathways or uh, scenarios, of course. We need, uh, we have different scenarios in the world energy outlook. We have the stated policies as I defined. That is a bit of uh, a mirror of the actions and intention of today's uh, policies. We have the SDS, the Sustainable Development Scenarios that provide more or a recommendation and strategic pathway to meet uh, climate goals, high quality and also energy access. And then there are additional scenarios that we developed. Uh, recently, last year, we started working with the net zero emission scenarios. They go a bit farther than the SDS, uh, trying to achieve global uh, net zero emissions by 2050. What questions we try to answer with the access model of uh, the real scenarios? For example, for electricity access, we try to understand how many people have gained in the past access. And so based on that and based on policies, how many people will gain access to electricity? Then we want to understand and we try to model how much electricity demand will come from them. So how much one person that is gaining access for the first time will consume, depending also on where it's located. Rural areas, for example, consume less. And now this demand is supplied by which system? Is a grid connection, is a mini grid, a uh, standalone system, and what kind of uh, connection it is? Renewable, is a fossil connection, etc. For clean cooking, we do a very similar thing. We try to understand the technology, how many people need to gain access, and that's how this will affect uh, the demand uh, of fuels. Then we go further to that and we estimate how much investment needs to be done to achieve the different scenarios and what are all the uh, related GAG emission, I will say, because we also estimate, for example, avoided emission from cooking uh, with biomass that of course, most of that is coming from uh, methane. If you go more in depth with the electricity access model, so we have uh, historic data of access to electricity that we estimate and track. Then we go to projections based on policy, historic trends, uh, targets that countries put in place. So of course, we put always, we are some kind of uh, conservatives, like if a country say I'm achieving full access by 2025, 20, but historic trends and policies are not very in line with that. We don't take the target 100%, of course. Then we, are, we estimate how much demand comes from that. And finally, where the supply is coming from based on a list cost solution analysis that we based uh, on a GIS, a college of spatial uh, data analysis. We do country by country using the onset tool from uh, for who, uh, who knows it. Again, this is similar to what we've seen uh, in the slide before. We do the electrification projection. We have the consumption per capita. And so we estimate what is the additional demand uh, due to access, how much electricity needs to be produced by type of technology. So we have some assumption, as I said, I think I already mentioned all this. Uh, there are some improvements we can do in our model, of course, for example, better understanding how people that are just connected uh, evolves in their uh, use of energy, et cetera, et cetera. We could also try to continue and take into account beyond uh, households to other uh, services, public services like schools, uh, hospitals, etc. Then we allocate all these uh, electricity demand to different end uses, also depending on what we just said. 
how do we do the power generation side? How do we say from this demand, what is coming from? As I said, we have some geospatial uh, data analysis that we do using the onset model, where we take into account per location. So we divide like, uh, for example, a country in different clusters of uh, populations, where we know the density, the infrastructure. So how distant is this from existing or planned grids, for example, we know the solar, the solar radiation. And so we can calculate what is the solution that will be the less costly to bring electricity to this area, depending on if people are connecting or, on, or, or not. We also have other inputs, of course, uh, prices, uh, target demand, et cetera. And then we have like the final supply coming from on-grid, mini-grid, and other off-grid uh, solutions that can permit us to estimate generation capacity, then investments, and also uh, related emissions. But how do we model more in details population gaining access? These are in the blue line, you see like total population, green line population with that has access. And let's say that the gray line separate historic in the left and projection on the right. If we, in our model, what we're going to do is we take the baseline uh, scenario in uh, yellow that says, okay, if we stay at the same access rate as uh, the last historic year, and we project it, how many people would have access? Then we look in our projections that we did, as I mentioned before, how many people are gaining access in our scenarios based on the assumption. That, and the difference for us is the population that is gaining access. So it's also a bit conservative here. We're not, we, are, we are considering that the population is increasing access, uh, uh, people with access also will increase with that because uh, if you are born in an area that is served by energy and that has the uh, wealth, uh, enough, wealth, enough, wealth enough to uh, afford the electricity, you will have access to electricity automatically. So our population getting access numbers are actually uh, conservative and smaller than what could be using another methodology. And then how do we model demand? So we have average regional electricity demand per capita increasing in our scenarios. Then we have someone that is gaining access, for example, in 2022. And step by step, year by year, it will increase is the uh, uh, first uh, demand that can be, for example, 50 kilowatt hours per person in rural areas or uh, 250 more or less per household till achieving uh, some years later, depending on the country, it can be 10, 12 years later, the average regional electricity demand. This is, of course, only on our uh, scenario uh, that achieve full access. These numbers are, of course, fake. I just put uh, some uh, graphics to show, for example, there are some people gaining access in 2022, some people gaining later and later, and there will be always at the point in the time at different levels of uh, consumption per capita, climbing the ladder of uh, consumption. I think this was my, my last slide. I didn't go in depth in clean cooking, but it's quite similar. And I thank you all very much. And uh, I'm very sorry I need to leave uh, soon, but I will be happy to take if there is any question uh, in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. This was really very interesting to see the inside uh, of the working of the access module of um, IA. There is a question in chat uh, from Tom Comper. What does this rapid access rate in slide six, seven mean for the distribution channels for the clean technologies in the least developed world? Can the, log the, can the logistic chains and business concept be developed that fast? In your slide six, where you had, um, this projection. Yeah, here. Uh, was uh, this slide? No. Yeah, it's the, the one with the, with the charts, yes. This one. Yeah, that's is super challenging, but actually in the pathway we developed, this is possible using a different mix of solutions. This is why also we have a Niger share in our uh, scenarios that are meeting and are achieving the SDG7 target of off-grid solution, then the least cost analysis will tell us. The least cost analysis will tell them more people will gain access through 
uh, to grid than this that you can see in this slide, but we had to improve to increase a bit the mini grids and standalone systems to be to, to this be deployable in a timely manner by 2030. So it is possible, but of course there is a need of a lot of uh, policy frameworks to be changed and uh, a lot of investments to come. Also, if the investments that are required, we estimated that at the global level, they represent only one to 2% of current energy spending. So it's something that is doable economically, the technologies are there. To go quick, you need like new solution, new business models. For example, the standalone system pay go model are increasing very fast and this permit people to have a kind of a leasing contract like uh, when you take a car and not pay for a solar system upfront cost, but pay every month for a kind of a rent for these products and then owning the products some, after some years. So this is, uh, this is how we see this. We see this possible, it's challenging and uh, I, I don't know if this will, this will happen. I hope, I hope yes, but uh, it's very, many things need to happen to the, for this to be achieved, yes. I don't know if I answered the question, I try to. I think that was the question. I, I have a follow up on that question. I mean, when we when you calculate or when you yes, when you calculate the number of people gaining access, do, do you consider any financial uh, constraints or uh, or financial financing means uh, in this, uh, let's say, projection of the people gaining access, or it is. What, what is the driver of, of the gaining access uh, in, in the model? How? So in, in the scenarios where we achieve the full access, we oblige the scenario to achieve full access. So everyone is getting access in this one that issues shows there. In the steps, of course, this is, in the steps is more natural, like uh, what will happen if uh, no further action is taken. This is, we impose it and then we look how much it will cost to do that and try to find the best uh, solution that uh, that can uh, supply this uh, mix of uh, let's say technologies providing access. However, when we do further analysis that is a bit outside of the model right now, we try to understand how many people that are gaining access cannot pay for it by themselves. And this is in Sub-Saharan Africa is a lot. I think with any solutions like uh, at least half of sub-Saharan African people cannot, cannot pay for an essential bundle of electricity. That this means like uh, some lighting, uh, a fan and a television. They couldn't pay it even with, uh, with uh, some low tariffs. So they need subsidies and uh, the, like lifeline tariffs or being out in, uh, in uh, achieving or getting these connections. I don't know if this answers your question, if it was on, on affordability or not. The financial solution. We are also looking at what is the mix of uh, different finance that should come there, public, private, and so on, but is outside the, of the models. Mm -hmm. From the results, we try to look at where this can come from on a best uh, mix. And we might have something interesting in, the, in a report uh, on Africa that will release uh, by April, May of this year, the new Africa outlook. We are trying to put there like really what is the best mix of investments of financing coming uh, in Africa to achieve not only access, but also uh, climate goals, uh, energy development goals, and other sides of the, the, um, the sectors. Thank you, Sonica. There is also one more uh, question in the chat from Maris Labiet. Uh, can you share a few more words about the cooking technologies that are included in the model? Uh, which types of biomass stoves and basically which efficiency levels? Uh, this is one part of the question. There are three uh, points there. Let's ta tackle one by one. So I don't know, maybe you can see also the chat uh, there. And if you want, you can tackle all of them or one by one. Whatever yeah. So for the types of biomass stops, we, we don't have a specific efficiency we define for uh, the improved cook stops, but uh, we consider these cook stops are uh, the most efficient available now. So yeah. Uh, include the gasifying uh, uh, cookstoves uh, and these kind of models that release very low uh, polluting particles. This is mostly in, in line with what uh, WHO says, like uh, as a recommendation for clean cooking. Like, 
And uh, may you include also some advanced biomass stove in the future, for instance, advanced gasifiers. Of course, this technology, this innovation allows these technologies to be clean enough only when this is happening, of course. Yeah, actually, actually in this violet area, like we include all these advanced technologies because we consider that most of today's cook stove, even the one that are a bit more efficient are not very in line with uh, what we consider clean cooking access uh, internationally. This is especially after working with uh, the WHO and on their definition of, uh, of this, that we, that we decide to do that. This is also why historically there is no, mm -hmm. uh, historically all people cooking with biomass are considered without access, even if maybe a couple of them have a very efficient uh, cooking stoves, but it's not many for the moment. And the last question for Maris is that there is an increasing focus on electric cooking, grid and off-grid. How is it currently modeled? Yeah, that's very true. And luckily we are, we are uh, touching it more and more. As you can see here, we have uh, not a very high share of people cooking with uh, electricity here, but this is because of many reasons. One is that these are people that are gaining first access to clean cooking. We have, of course, much more people that are electric cooking than uh, this small share here. And these are people that, for example, are shifting from uh, LPG or, or gas or other clean technologies to electricity. This is happening even more than what you can see here. And we consider that uh, also on the off-grid side, of course, we see that it's possible for certain solutions, especially with mini grids. Uh, there is a big talk also with uh, standalone systems, uh, solar home system and batteries being able to do that, but this is very limited for the moment. Uh, it's a very interesting topic we are touching. We'll have some, uh, some analysis in the Africa report, of course. Uh, but it's, yeah, in the model, like uh, we are conservative on that because also of our knowledge on the level of electricity access people are gaining when they gain access and what is the average today in Africa? As I also Shonali shows, uh, showed before, like uh, many people have access, but their uh, uh, the reliability and quality of their access and their ability to pay for this electricity is very, is very limited. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, Gianluca, for this useful insights. I don't see other question in the chat. Ah, there is one more, just came from Gabriela Garces, uh, how one can consider in the model factors such as social policies, social policies, environmental, etc., that can influence in your assumption of the model that people will get access to energy along the time. So how these uh, factors, which are uh, policies or environmental policies or social policies, So I, I don't know if I understood the questions. Is if we take into account policies that are beyond directly access policies, like other exactly policies. yes, yes, other policies, and also beyond the energy sector per se, as I understand the question, that goes also to the social dimension. Social that's, a, that's a very important point. Actually, we we don't do it all the time, but uh, of course, for environmental and climate policies, many times they are helpful for all of these. Uh, work we do, especially for, for example, for electricity access, where depending on the uh, climate policies of a country, we have a different share of uh, renewable technologies. It's not only depending on that, it's also depending on uh, availability of resources, of course, and affordability, but the climate policy play, plays a role there, especially in the SDS, where we need to achieve uh, uh, well below two degrees uh, targets. And uh, about social policies, this is something we are doing more and more now, but it's not directly in, in the model for access right now. But it's something we are looking more and more, especially we are looking on another side, probably on uh, externalities. We are looking to see like there is a policies that try to improve uh, agriculture. Is this also taking into account how energy is provided in the, these uh, rural areas? And so like uh, this uh, can be also something we take into account or for example, other way around, we take into account how access policies can influence social indicators, like how many jobs can be produced. These are 
not the same thing you're asking, but uh, interesting. We're trying to estimate how many jobs can be created uh, by providing access to people by the different technologies. And this is something we are doing right now. I think we'll have some, some first figures uh, for the upcoming report. Hopefully, we'll keep improving this modeling also uh, in the future. Sorry, I couldn't answer very well, but uh, yeah, we're not directly accounting for social policies, for example. Climate, yes, but uh, for mm -hmm. the other ones, it's very complicated to, to put them there if there is not a direct uh, target or uh, measure that uh, affects electricity connections or clean cooking access. Yeah. Yeah. And uh... Ah, okay, confirmed. Gabriela confirmed that uh, uh, social and environmental aspects influence access to, to energy, and it's important to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. I'm cautious about the time. I don't want to keep everyone very late to today. So I would uh, like now to invite Antonio Dagnaccio from PPL to share the screen and uh, Let's see if we, I hope everything will be okay. Okay, we can see it. And Antone, unmute yourself so that we can hear you also. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, uh, Evangelist, thank you. Uh, should we start now? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Antone. Uh, I'm a uh, researcher at PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And today uh, I'm going to share the methodology that we are using or developing to, to model uh, electricity demand for productive uses of energy. Uh, it's, it, it's really nice to follow up uh, with Shanali uh, after Shanali and Gianluca's presentation because they have done most of the work for, uh, for, uh, to, to explain the energy access challenge in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so in this presentation, yeah, Gianluca uh, presented about household and community uses and then productive uses. And then in our definition, we'll bring the household enterprises, so the household productive use of energy within uh, a household level. Uh, just to start with as a background, uh, I want to start with the, our uh, previous work. So in the past few years, we've explored energy access challenges in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, uh, the similar uh, way uh, that uh, the IA is doing and the ESI is doing. Um, we've modeled universal access to clean uh, uh, and modern energy for both electricity uh, and cooking. Uh, so in the left figure, as you can see, uh, the baseline development trends, how, over half a billion people will have uh, no access to electricity by 2030. That's about 36% of uh, the projected original population. Uh, and it shows also that this energy poverty is increasingly uh, being concentrated in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, however, if we increase the effort to provide universal access in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that both uh, off-grid systems and centralized central grid systems play a considerable role. Uh, this projection, for example, is on baseline level of consumption. Uh, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the multi-tier framework. So in that case, this will be tier three and tier four, depending on, on the region. Um, but if we look at the lower levels of consumption, for example, say tier one, uh, we, we have seen that about 60% of the population will could be connected through off-grid systems. But if we go to the higher level of consumption of a tier five, then that would be about five or 6% of the population that would gain access through off-grid systems. Uh, one very important characteristic about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is that it's a, 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 a large areas of very low population density with very low level of income and low level of uh, uh, electricity consumption. So these combinations uh, make off-grid systems more viable than the central system. Uh, we've also looked at uh, the investment needs to achieve universal access, but also the baseline. We see that uh, by 2030, on average, we need 16 billion US dollars a year. Uh, but if we want to achieve universal access, uh, we need 33 billion US dollars on top of the baseline investment. So we, it requires a tripling of uh, the baseline investment in order to achieve universal access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but the thing is, closing this electricity access gap requires 
not only just this adequate amount of investment, but also the understanding of the requirements, the technologies, the risk and opportunities in the region, uh, preferably backed by robust data and you know, scenario analysis and model projections to inform uh, uh, policy making. Um, those previous studies that I just showed uh, did indicate how big the task is uh, uh, to achieve universal access to clean and modern energy in Sub-Saharan Africa. But that's only, or also only based on uh, end use service demand. So demand for uh, space heating, space cooling, water heating, cooking, and lighting and appliances. Uh, but studies show that this is not enough. Access to basic levels of electricity is not enough. We need to provide people enough electricity to generate incomes, to improve uh, livelihood. Uh, so that is the, the, what we refer here, the productive uses of energy at household level. That's aimed at enhancing income generation opportunities uh, and productivity uh, at household level. Uh, here we use a very narrow definition for productive use of energy than what was mentioned by uh, uh, the previous presentation. Uh, we are referring to the household enterprises, very small micro enterprises that could be done at household level uh, and then consume electricity. Uh, this could be, for example, for agricultural uses like irrigation, uh, agro processing like milling and hurling kind of operations, manufacturing, very small carpentry, uh, welding uh, and tailoring kinds, and the service sector like restaurants, uh, like small uh, drinks uh, uh, services or a beauty salon uh, kind of things. So these uh, activities would create additional income. They will generate additional income, but, and this income could be taxable, but uh, it rarely is. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we know that there is a very high level of unemployment, but that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that most of the economic activity is dominated by in the informal sector. Uh, there are studies that show that in some parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, about 80% of the labor force uh, is self-employed, well, uh, the majority of it in the informal sector, and about 42% of the rural sub-Saharan Africa do operate micro-enterprises. Uh, however, we see that these entrepreneurial activities are needs-driven rather than aiming for profit maximization. You know? So they are driven by the need to uh, diversify income, uh, the need uh, to mitigate uh, the risk from population growth or loss of land or climate change. Uh, so this productive use of energy that we're referring here are uh, usually for avoiding slipping further into poverty than, than po for poverty elevation. And they are done at very low uh, level uh, at the household with uh, five household members uh, uh, maximum. Uh, given the role of agriculture in the economy in Sub-Saharan Africa, we expect that increased and improved crop processing uh, could become uh, very relevant in, in the economic activities of rural Sub-Saharan Africa. At the moment, uh, most of the crop processing is done manually. Uh, so electrification of the process uh, improves the productivity and reduces the processing time. Even if it is being done now uh, with diesel generators, for example, if we go to uh, off-grid systems or uh, uh, yeah, so mini grids or centralized grids, if we get that electrification level, we can see that it can have the energy cost uh, at the same time doubling uh, the profit margins for, for the household. Uh, in general, most of the crop that's produced in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is exported from that locality uh, without much processing. So establishing this agriculture value chain increases uh, local value creation. However, the challenge is that uh, there's not really much work uh, done in this area. So that shows the role of electricity access, for example, in entrepreneurial activity or the performance of, of an enterprise. Uh, so this is uh, done from scratch with, uh, with uh, uh, an, a master's student from Utrecht University. Uh, she has done a lot of work in collecting a large part of the data, analyzing and creating some uh, analysis models. Uh, so here we have uh, done clust. As I said, the irrigation is already done uh, in the timer model, so it's not part of this project. Uh, so we do here two classes. One is the agro uh, micro enterprises, and the other one is the agro micro enterprises that I just mentioned earlier. 
for agro processing, uh, it's very much straightforward. So we first need to identify the common crop types, uh, and we have the image land model that provides crop production uh, at one kilometer by one kilometer resolution until 2100. So we have a very uh, detailed data about that the types of crops in a grid cell uh, and the level of production productivity. Uh, and the second step would be to identify uh, crop processing operations that are involved. Uh, and then from those processing operations, we need to identify the ones that can be done at a micro enterprise scale. Uh, and then the third step will be uh, to estimate electricity demand of each processing operation. Now, if we have this all, then that gives us the electricity demand uh, for agro processing. So that is the first stage. Uh, here you see in the left side, is the crop processing electricity demand per unit for uh, representative crops in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and on the, on the right side, we see the annual crop produced per grid cell. So this is a snapshot of the grid cells. We have over 9,000 grid cells. Uh, so we have production, annual production for every year until 2100, uh, if we want to uh, calculate uh, this. Uh, so that is how the agro-processing uh, electricity demand is modeled. Uh, the second category is the non-agro micro enterprises. This is a bit complex. Uh, it involves four uh, sub modules. The first one is to project the odds of a certain event uh, to take place and that event being uh, entrepreneurial activity. So we have the uh, binomial uh, logic regressions on the probability of a household uh, to be engaged in uh, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and the second, module is the connection module that projects an the, the odd of an, an enterprise getting access to electricity. Uh, so that's also another binomial uh, logic regression uh, that to project uh, the probability of uh, an enterprise to have access to electricity. And the third module is the sales module. So that uh, projects the annual sales of an enterprise. So this is uh, to see if, uh, the performance. So we, uh, this is another linear regression uh, to analyze the uh, to project the annual sales of an enterprise. Now, this is usually supported. We have a lot of uh, enterprise survey from the World Bank, uh, and the last one is the consumption model, uh, and that projects electrical electricity consumption of an enterprise. So this is also another uh, linear regression model on electricity consumption for enterprises. We also get a lot of data from uh, World Bank uh, enterprise survey. So one thing I need to mention here is that this is not done for each and every type of uh, uh, enterprise, but just the average enterprise at the grid cell. So it could be various different si uh, types of inter enterprises, but we look at an average enterprise in a grid cell to project uh, LFC demand for uh, at a household level. This requires a lot of data. We have uh, several drivers, 23 drivers, uh, for example, for these uh, projection models. Uh, some of them, you can see them here, like employed men and women, uh, female headed households, uh, the lending interest rate, for example, uh, development assistance received. Uh, so uh, it's not very easy to find this data. Some of them are uh, at high resolution, so we can find them at grid sale level, and some of them are at country level data, some are regional uh, data that are extrapolated or interpolated uh, to fill uh, the, data, the data gaps. Uh, and that is uh, always a challenge. So we have uh, World Bank, USAID, uh, and other uh, literature as source uh, for this data. Uh, here, I want to show you some results of this. Uh, this is uh, a preliminary result, so please don't quote me yet on this one. Uh, the green bars show the household energy demand for induced services. So that's what we used in our previous studies. Uh, at re so this is a original total. Uh, with this, we determined, for example, a distribution of technologies, the investment requirements, as well as uh, residential electricity consumption related uh, emissions. Uh, the yellow and the, the, the red bar, they show the productive use of energy for agro processing and for uh, non agro uh, SMEs, uh, uh, micro enterprises. Uh, so as you can see in, for example, Eastern Africa and Southern Africa, uh, the demand for productivity of energy at household level is actually almost as equal as uh, the induced service demand. So that is a significant increase uh, on energy demand, which will have a significant impact on energy planning, uh, the role of decentralized systems or the investment requirements or residential related emissions. 
Uh, just to show simple uh, analysis here, what we did was, for example, on the left side, you see uh, the tech system mix. So for central, the blue is the central grid, uh, the red is the mini grid, and the green is the standalone system. So on the left is only for induced uh, energy services that we used it before. On the right is when we add productive uses of energy uh, at the household level. So you see that a significant shift from decentralized systems to centralized systems, but also from uh, standalone systems to mini grid systems. So this requires increasing generation capacity of the central grid, uh, new transmission and distribution uh, network, uh, new distribution network for the for the mini grids, for example. But also in general, it shows the need uh, for long term strategy to integrate uh, decentralized systems into a, a larger network or a central uh, to the central system. Uh, in, a, in a form of, I don't know, swarm electrification is one of the, the possibilities, for example. Uh, so, yeah, this is my last slide. Uh, so, uh, adding this productive use of energy uh, to the household electricity demand does considerably change the landscape for energy planning. Uh, so, we recommend one of the recommendations that off grid system should be designed ready for integration into a, a larger network. Uh, but I also have to say, due to this explorative nature of this study, we have a lot of independent variables that we analyzed. Uh, but until uh, we model it completely and run sensitivity analysis, it's very difficult to tell how far we are from the final product. Uh, and also, maybe in the, in the long run, we want to add more activities like aquaculture and livestock, uh, but also integrate this work with our previous work where we looked at the role of governance on electricity access. And that would give us even a better idea of what uh, the roles of these different technologies and systems and investment requirements for universal access. Uh, and also earlier, uh, Gianluca was talking about affordability. And also, I think that uh, this adding the product use of energy in the energy planning does improve the viability of the economic viability of decentralized systems in general. Uh, yeah, so that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atna, for this insightful presentation. Um, I would like to ask the three speakers one, one question based on the results, for, first of all, that uh, Sonali shared with us before, that uh, even maybe in 2050, um, we will not maybe able to have um, all the people having clean energy access. Uh, what, what are the biggest hurdles um, in achieving to the path towards the path to clean energy, is it uh, mostly geopolitical? Is social? Is technological? Is financial? What? Where the challenges really are there? It's everything. So I would like to to hear first from Ali and then uh, Gianluca if if he's with us and then Anthony. Yeah, thank you, Evangelos. Uh, so, I mean, in, in what we have analyzed, we take more of a demand perspective in the work that we've done as I presented earlier as well. And uh, for us, the biggest constraint is not so much technology. Technology exists, but it's really affordability. So in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia as well, uh, you will continue to have a large proportion of the population that earns very, very little and uh, is therefore able to afford very little. Uh, and, and that's a huge issue um, in terms of, I mean, it's also, of course, a question of uh, investments and capacity for, uh, you know, expanding access in regions where infrastructure does not exist. Uh, that's also a challenge. Um, but actually at a global scale, we have the technologies and we also have the finance. It's just directing it to the regions where this is needed the most. Uh, and even in terms of affordability, I mean, there are parts of the population that will not be able to afford it. But then again, there are policies that one can implement to make it affordable for populations that are low income, for instance. Um, so, I mean, in, 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 in most cases, we have solutions to achieve uh, universal access, but it's really uh, sort of implementing and putting these actions, uh, putting these solutions into action. Thank you, Sonali. Gianluca, are, are you with us or? 
maybe not. Uh, Antone, what is your opinion on that? Uh, so I have to say, I completely agree with Shanali. So I, it's not really much I can add, but uh, we've done also the similar study on governance of the electricity system in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what we found out is there is huge institutional challenge uh, to provide access to electricity. The resources are there, the money is running around globally, but just getting those resources together uh, in a way uh, that is a win-win for everyone is very challenging. And, and the political aspect of it is, is seriously hindering a lot of uh, progress uh, in that sense. Thank you, thank you both, indeed. So you, you don't. So we have the technologies. That's that's important. Is the fact that we need to be more brave in distribution, the efforts. And, the, and my second question is regarding the modeling of energy access. Now we have presented. Um, we have, we got two nice presentations, with, uh, which are rich in the insights, and. Uh, where, what are the biggest challenges in the modeling? Uh, we have heard that it's about data, it's about sectors. Um, what else, where we need to improve our frameworks to aid policymakers? Um, what other sectors perhaps we should consider? And um, yeah, I would like to see where do you see that we can improve our frameworks there on modeling the access. So, Sonali. Yeah, so I mean, I can go first. Um, um, I mean, I think uh, what was said before is, is very true. We do have big data gaps. And unfortunately, we have uh, the biggest data gaps in the regions where we have the biggest access challenge. <laughs> uh, and so that makes it uh, particularly challenging for modeling. Uh, having said that, uh, there are many um, sort of exciting new uh, possibilities. So, you know, while surveys are, of course, the richest source of information, uh, it was mentioned also by Jan Loka that they're expensive to do and you can't do them that frequently. Uh, uh, so, but there are now, uh, I think, increasingly very detailed Earth observation satellite based information uh, data products out there that can be combined with survey information, for instance. Uh, or can be used uh, as uh, an additional source of information that can be, um, you know, filling in gaps for years where you don't have surveys, for instance. And we've done work in our own group where we've kind of looked at uh, satellite-based uh, data sources, not just the night lights, which of course has been used a lot, but layering night lights information with information on building cover, on population distribution, and so on and so forth. And this does provide a fairly rich additional uh, source of information that can be used. Um, so, I mean, while there are data gaps, I think there are also increasingly opportunities for uh, filling these gaps in many cases. And Antone? You agree? Um, I, I guess you agree. Eh? <laughs> I mean, basically, I, I completely agree with Shanley as well. I mean, one is, yeah, so there is data limitation. That's obvious, right? It's, all, it's not only limitation, but also there is now uh, invented data, you know, so that's not realistic data that's been running around in publications. And we're just taking those data and plugging it in. It doesn't really help. But I think more than the modeling, because we're doing uh, different bits and pieces in different places. Uh, and that's uh, bringing this effort together is one thing. That really would be very helpful. But I think the, the challenge is more on making sure that the, the model results have impact on policies than just modeling themselves. You know, that ownership aspect of that trust from the politicians and that transparency. That's what we lack, I think. Were efforts towards this direction so far, you think, from the research community, it was enough what we have do? If you're asking me, no, I don't, I don't think it's enough, but that's that's the direction that we're going. I mean, we're trying to, to open up. Uh, there is a lot of now open source uh, models, uh, open source data. We're trying to do uh, wiki based documentations of all the all the data uh, and also the, the, the code uh, should be open. It should be just accessible. Uh, and also this co-creation thing, you know, so if if I'm working on sub saharan Africa from, from an island from, from here in the Netherlands, and then there is a really small impact that it will have on, on the continental energy system. But if we can do this 
co-creation kind of thing. If we have some kind of modeling forums, uh, uh, capacity building, knowledge sharing at, uh, activities, I think that would definitely make, uh, make it useful. Um, I have a, a question uh, more, but I will go to the chat for the moment. Uh, how important, it's from Tom Kober again, uh, how important is interregional cooperation for accelerating access to clean energy? And what is the role of cross-national harmonized regulatory frameworks? Uh, is this studied enough? Uh, personally, and then Antone, I would like to hear both of you. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is a role to be played. And I think in the African context, there has been some research that's been done on this. I, I'm not that familiar with it, but I do remember, I do recall that there was some uh, research that was done at some point, and maybe Anthony has a better idea of it, on kind of um, connecting uh, different regional grids within the African context to somehow help with um, expanding access to energy. Um, I mean, I think in certain contexts, it can help. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, even national utilities need to improve, uh, you know, efforts at uh, strengthening their uh, transmission and distribution infrastructure and networks. Uh, and so uh, I think, you know, we can, we can talk about interregional at an international scale or, you know, interregional at a national scale, uh, depends on what your, your objective is. And, and certainly that can help. But I think for the most part, uh, there is really an effort to build capacities amongst the utilities and amongst the you know, energy sector um, stakeholders uh, at a much wider level than exists today. Uh, and that's very true of regions where access is lacking the most. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Sonali. What is uh, yeah, your it's, opinion it's, about that? It's a really important point that he raised because basically energy resources are also not really distributed uh, equally. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, if we look at, uh, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, you have got natural gas somewhere, uh, wind power on, on, on the other side, and on solar a bit equally distributed, but geothermal concentrated in the Rift Valley areas and all these things, you know, so it's basically very important. It's really good to have this integrated approach to, to energy planning at, uh, at regional level. We have regional power pools. I think that's why they were also established is to facilitate this energy trade between countries. And then if we can do it also within the regions, I think it's amazing. So, and uh, the second comment from uh, Tom Kober is that there is the impression uh, so far, at least relates to the previous question, of course, that we are too much on the technology level and less on, on the governance and institutional level with our modeling. So is this a direction where we should make more, more effort uh, and to, to incorporate these aspects into the modeling? Is this possible, you think, uh, Sonali? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely true. I think there's much less uh, focus on the government and governance and institutional aspects. And uh, Anthony has done work on this. And even within our research group, we are doing increasingly more research on this topic. Uh, whether it should be done within the models or done outside of models, that's another question. Uh, and, and one could debate that. Uh, but I mean, I think definitely focus on governance and institutional capacities and how the different levels of this across different contexts matter for how policies are implemented. That is a very, very important topic. And, and uh, certainly we are seeing increasing research that is looking at these institutional and governance factors and how they affect implementation of policy and how they have related to uh, expansion of energy access and other uh, energy uh, systems goals, energy goals, uh, climate goals internationally. So, I mean, I think that's something that we will see increasingly and it may mean work that's done outside of models, but in some cases, maybe it will also be incorporated within modeling frameworks. Thank you, Sonali. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. No, Shonali is absolutely right again. Uh, it's a question is whether you want to incorporate it within the modeling or if you want to look at it, okay, you have a modeling result and then how is it impacted by mm -hmm. governance issues? We did two work on that one. Also one with Shonali on integrating uh, policies for the three uh, targets of SDG7. Uh, so we looked at how that would, have, that would impact access but also efficiency uh, uh, and also emissions uh, the climate impact of that uh, and also with a, with another group we did a study about uh, the, the role of governance in the whole earth is the access so what uh, the risk that is involved because of the the government policies that are not very clear or that does not very inclusive uh, that are very corrupt government systems and all these things so we did look at it what that risk means for LST access and we did manage uh, we did try to model it so somehow it reflects that impact of governance thank you thank you both that's very important indeed and i have one more question regarding uh, africa especially and um, africa has huge potentials has a potential for renewables has a very rich underground uh, resources uh, how do you see in your scenarios, in your projections, the role of Africa in the future? And how do you see the possibility of Africa uh, to develop um, and take, let's say, share from the current shift that we see in, in industry that is moving now to, from Europe to Asia? Can it go to Africa and through this process, this transformation process, energy access can be, can be improved? So do you see that the role of Africa in, in future, in your projections, is increasing? And towards which direction, what is the driver, and how this could affect the population to get more access to clean energy? Um, I think Anthony should take that question first <laughs> rather than me, but I mean, I'll take a first shot at it and then maybe Anthony has much more to say, I'm sure, on it. Um, so, I mean, I think, of course, uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the presentation that Anthony made on the productive uses of energy, because I think this is really a key issue. Uh, very often we are talking about access to energy services, and of course, we are focusing very much on the residential sector and providing people with basic access that at least gives them you know uh, some welfare improvement and this is of course totally essential but ultimately if we really want to improve well-being and and get people to a decent life everywhere uh, you need to provide productive opportunities you need to provide employment you need to provide an opportunity for them to earn income because it's only through you know, income, they can afford more energy services as well. And so, I mean, I think clearly linking to the whole industrial development and employment uh, opportunities on the African continent or other regions where uh, access is lacking is, is very, very important. Uh, and as, and there, there are huge opportunities, as you said, I mean, they have huge resources, uh, but the issue is, of course, getting the financing and getting the investments happening there so that those resources can be productively used uh, and that it can fuel uh, industrial growth and industrial development and uh, you know better welfare for the people of that region uh, but yeah I, mean, I, I am sure anthony has more to say so i'll stop there uh, thank you, Shanali. I've really covered uh, much of it, actually. So it is true that there is a huge amount of uh, renewable resources in Africa. So I think this is now a very uh, crucial point where choices have to be made because there is an opportunity that there is not really much infrastructure, energy infrastructure built in Africa. So a lot of it needs to be done now uh, and in the future. So if you make a choice now to do it in a renewable way, then you can do it, you can achieve it, but you can also go and then explore the coal and, and, uh, uh, and the gas, and then later will be a regret solution. So I think uh, in general, also with the productive use of energy, the economy is still growing, and that would provide uh, the, uh, so uh, economic, economic uh, viability to 
all kinds of systems that you build because affordability will increase. And what Shonali mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the policies that would support the poor, uh, if you have this uh, productive use of energy, if, if there are economy, uh, economic activities that you build uh, the grid or, or the electricity system for, then the poor can benefit from that uh, with a, a low investment. Uh, but also at the same time, there are huge uh, geopolitical challenges when it comes, for example, for hydropower. We've seen what, what has been happening in the past three, four years between Ethiopia, Egypt and Sudan, uh, very huge struggle. So it's a renewable energy, but uh, there are serious consequences when it comes to geopolitics. So I think <laughs> it's a very complex issue, but it's an opportunity. It's not just it's only a challenge. It's also an opportunity now. Yeah. It's the most important, that's an opportunity. Um, there is an, one more question in the chat uh, from Gabriela Garces again. And how about the potentials of using waste residues, organic and inorganics, uh, for energy generation? How to support the link of both sectors with policies and to encourage investments? So who, who wants to answer this first? Sonali? <laughs> Yeah, I am by default being told to answer for <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, Yes, I mean, of course, there is a huge history of also biogasification and, and the use of waste matter for energy generation uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, there's no doubt that this can be a resource that should be perhaps better utilized also in the energy sector. But there are again challenges there because, um, I mean, for instance, I, I take the example of India because I know in the Indian context the best. Uh, biogas was touted as, a, you know, a really a great solution also for clean cooking access, even in the 70s and 80s in India. Uh, and, and the technology to use it uh, has existed since the 80s, really speaking. Uh, but there are social factors that have not really resulted in this being taken up. So there, there are issues with handling waste that uh, have taboos associated with it in certain cultures and certain contexts. Um, so I mean, I think th there's certainly potential and I think there's certainly uh, a need for policies that will help to really utilize waste more effectively uh, without causing pollution also um, in the energy sector. Uh, but I, I don't myself, I'm not aware of uh, examples of how this is happening effectively in, um, in different parts of the world. Uh, it's something I haven't focused on much, so I can't really say very much on, but. Yeah, it's certainly something that needs further investigation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't have much to add on this. I'm not also an expert on this one, but we did one of the studies for cooking, for example, uh, uh, we did with uh, uh, waste residues as uh, a source for uh, biogas and all, and it has a potential, but there is uh, enormous amount of investment required as, as, as a, a startup investment but then running cost would be very low uh, uh, compared to the others but when you look at for example in african countries there are all places where they use them for electricity generation and all these things but for for cooking uh, if you uh, the there is lack of that initial capital at the household level so they are not able, uh, able to build that thing and then run it for free because there's a very limited income daily income is very limited so they just survive day to day so i think there should be a support and a policy system where they would be subsidized uh, of the initial building and then on the long run they could pay it off that would be interesting but i didn't do much work on this one so i can't say a lot um, but it's an important sector let's see uh, i don't see other question in the chat if someone else has a question uh, now you can put it in the chat or you can um, open the microphone and ask it otherwise I will uh, end the session, but before I end the session, I would like to ask Sonali and Antene one final question. So what is your next step in the research? So what is to be expected from you in the next uh, 
uh, here, let's say, what is on the pipeline, the new hot topic. <laughs> Um, yeah, so within uh, our research group at YASA, we are uh, increasingly focusing very much uh, on the last topic that I presented also, sort of like energy for decent living. Uh, that's something that we will continue to research uh, and we are uh, expanding our research in that. Uh, and also sort of looking at low energy demand scenarios where you know people have access to the services that they they need, uh, but at the same time, we're doing this with low energy demand uh, and meeting climate goals, for instance. So that's one, one area of research that, uh, that we are going to be working more on in, in the next months. Uh, we're also continuing to do research on sort of measure, better measurement and tracking of access and energy poverty. That's an area of research we continue to work on. And then uh, while we haven't really started doing very much research in terms of modeling, uh, we are doing a lot of empirical analysis on looking at how access to energy relates to entrepreneurial activity and agricultural activity in, in uh, largely in the sub-Saharan African context. So again, sort of seeing, does it really matter for the agricultural sector and for the non-farm enterprise sector to have access to energy and whether there are other complementary uh, services that you need to really uh, spur and entrepreneurial activity and uh, productive activities. Uh, so yeah, that's that's some of the research we'll be doing. We will be exciting to hear more of when we see it. And Antone, what is the plan? Uh, yeah, so the priority will be to uh really complete the, the productive the modeling the productive use of energy and we want to uh, bring out a paper as soon as possible uh, because I think that's going to be that's going to add uh, mm. some value to to the modeling aspect uh, the other one would be we want to co-create some kind of modeling programs in in, in Africa in sub-saharan Africa so to to improve the uh, ownership uh, of uh, model results uh, out of the energy sector, I will be looking at more at the NDCs and the impact on the climate and also on the energy system. Uh, uh, so those are the, the few uh, projects that I have at the moment. Thank you both. Thank you both. Uh, there is also uh, interest from the participants to be in touch with you uh, regarding, especially, for instance, Gabriela said, writes, I will be glad to be in touch as I'm working on the waste sector in India in the German cooperation at the University of Stuttgart in Latin America. So probably uh, if you agree, some, some of our participants will, uh, will be in contact to get a little bit more insights and probably collaborations. So thank you everyone for uh, joining our uh, um, webinar, our last webinar on integrating sustainable development goals into energy systems and integrated assessment models. Um, I thank you very much that you stayed so late uh, with us and I would like uh, to all of us to give an applause to our speakers and uh, thank you very much for um, all the insights that you gave us today and for your presentations. Uh, the webinars will be uploaded uh, into the EdsUp uh, YouTube channel and to the EdsUp uh, website together with the presentations. I will collect them. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Evangelist. Thank Bye, you everyone. Very Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.